بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابة أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We shall start today's event, inshallah, with recitation of the Holy Quran by Brother Ibrahim Khan. Shukran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفمن شرح الله صدره للإسلام فهو على نور من ربه فويل للقاسية قلوبهم من ذكر الله أولئك في ظلال مبين الله نزل أحسن الحديث كتابا تشابها مثانية تقشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم ثم تلين جلودهم وقلوبهم إلى ذكر الله ذلك هدى الله يهدي به من يشاء ومن يضلل الله فما له من هاد أفمن يتقي بوجهه سوء العذاب يوم القيامة وقيل للظالمين ذوقوا ما كنتم تكسبون كذب الذين من قبلهم فأتاهم العذاب من حيث لا يشعرون فأذاقهم الله الخزي في الحياة الدنيا ولعذاب الآخرة أكبر لو كانوا يعلمون ولقد ضربنا للناس في هذا القرآن من كل مثل من كل مثل لعلهم يتذكرون قرآنا عربيا غير ذي عوج لعلهم يتقون ضرب الله مثلا رجلا فيه شركاء متشاكسون متشاكسون ورجلا سلما لرجل هل يستويان مثلا الحمد لله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون إنك ميت وإنهم وإنهم ميتون ثم إنكم يوم القيامة عند ربكم تختصمون شكرا
Jazakallahu khair, Brother Ibrahim Khan. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord, cherisher, and sustainer of the world. May his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, his household, his companions, and all those who follow his true way, his values, until the appointed time. I bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Allah, who has ordained for himself mercy. I also bear witness that Muhammad is his last and final messenger, sent to the whole of mankind, and a clear guide towards attaining salvation in this world as well as in the hereafter. Our scholars, leaders, dignitaries, government officials and representatives, elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, and for those who do not profess the Islamic faith, brothers and sisters in humanity, I salute you once again with the greeting of peace, the greeting of our father Adam, the greeting of the people of Jannah Paradise, and that is Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I welcome you all to this assembly. Insha'Allah, a gathering of excellence in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I wish to remind myself and also remind you, my brothers and sisters, that as the nation of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our position in this world is a position of leadership and not a position of followership. Allah has bestowed upon this nation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this position for the benefit of humanity. Many in the world today are looking upon our way of life, Islam, and also are looking up to us as followers of this deen so that they can attain peace and attain tranquility for themselves. Also attain peace and tranquility with their creator and also attain peace and tranquility with all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. We as an ummah shall not be able to play this role of guidance and fulfill our obligation if those who are looking up to us for this guidance are confused as to who we really are. Because of the different images and variations of the way of life that we, the followers of this deen, are actually exhibiting. We are the major players of the confusion that exists now about Islam as well as its followers. We are not going to be able to attain the purpose of our creation if we ourselves are confused as to who we are as to who we are supposed to be and how do we be who we are supposed to be. By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have been guided here today and those who are not here are able to follow us live through Radio Rahma and also we have streaming live through Facebook. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen that today we engage our minds so that we can be guided as to how we can walk this journey and give the true image of Islam so that we play our role. The theme of the series of lectures of today and inshallah tomorrow is fragrance that lingers. In the words of our speaker, not a physical fragrance. I will leave it to him to 
explain more on what this fragrance is and why this fragrance and how we the followers of Muhammad can actually attain this fragrance and leave it behind for others to benefit from. Today we are honored to have our own, a global scholar born and raised in Africa, specifically in Zimbabwe, recognized worldwide as evidenced by the millions of followers all over the world across different social platforms. He is here to hold our hands and engage our minds on the journey towards dealing with this confusion. That is why the topic of today of our lecture is dealing with confusion. Our speaker, alhamdulillah, is recognized as one of the top 500 most influential Muslims in the world. And this was since 2010. For me, this is not a surprise, given his personal style of engagement that I have observed. Personally, Brother Mufti, I refer to your style as the reconciliatory unifying style. May Allah give tawfiq to that style. It is this style that has endeared him to many, especially the youth who are the future of tomorrow, and also the sisters who are the mothers of this ummah. His influence, I know, personally extends the fraternity of the Muslims. Personally, I have heard sent to me on WhatsApp clip about various topics and lectures by my colleagues and students who are non-Muslims. He travels the world as evidenced by his second visit this time to Kenya, spreading a simple but very strong message. And the message is, do good, help others while preparing for the hereafter. This reminds me of the words of Allah when Allah said, Indeed, man is in loss except for those who believe and do good. He is a strong advocator of peace and justice and a strong opponent of all forms of injustices including terrorism. He has studied Sharia in Medina and holds a doctorate of social guidance. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him tawfiq and to give tawfiq to his message. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts and may they be among your hasanat fi mizanika yawmul qiyamah. It is my pleasure an honor to welcome our guest, our speaker for the day, and inshallah tomorrow, the Chief Mufti of Zimbabwe, Mufti Ismail Musa Meng. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most gracious most merciful Alhamdulillah was salatu was salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Indeed we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Lord of the worlds the creator nourisher cherisher sustainer provider protector and curer of one and all the one in complete control over every aspect of existence. And we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless him and his entire family, his whole household as well as all his companions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of you. Ameen. My beloved brothers and sisters in this beautiful city of Nairobi in Kenya. Firstly, I am very appreciative of the warm welcome that I had in this beautiful city. And it's not the first time that I've been here. And secondly, I want to acknowledge that many of you have arrived here very early. 
And some of you were unable to make it perhaps. And as you know, we are going to try our best to beam this across the globe. Those who won't get it live will probably get it later on. The theme of this tour is fragrance that lingers. Where did it come from? It came from a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wherein he speaks of the importance of good company. And that is point number one that I want to start with. Every one of us, we have a circle of people around us. Please make sure they are good people. Please make sure they instill in you beautiful values. Please make sure that they are people who direct you towards that which will please Allah. Please make sure that they are people who would be able to help you get away from that which will displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the biggest impact upon a person are those whom he or her, he or she associates with. So those who have the biggest impact on you are those whom you see on a daily basis. You see them, you talk to them, you sit with them. Those whom you are in their company or they are in your company. If they happen to be good company, good news to you. If they are bad company, you won't even realize you are losing your values, you are losing your morals, you are losing your faith, you are losing your belief. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So the Prophet peace be upon him says the example of good company and the example of bad company is similar to a person who sells, similar to a person who sells perfumes on one hand and on the other hand a person who is a blacksmith who blows into the iron ore in order to purify it. He says, the one who is selling perfume, if you are in his company, what will happen? Well, if you're lucky, he will give you a gift. Subhanallah. You might get some of that perfume as a gift. You know, a person who's your friend, they have a store, they have all the latest perfumes, and you're looking at them and so on, and they say, you're my friend. Would you like one of these? Just choose which one would you like from here? And you're smiling so broad, you cannot believe that, you know what, I'm being offered free perfume. So it's possible if they are your friends. And it's possible if you are in their company. But you and I know that business is not that good these days, right? Don't expect your friend to start giving you free bees. I have a habit and a policy. Whenever I go to get something, buy something, do something, I love to pay. I love to pay because... The relationship will remain longer if we paid, even if it was slightly discounted, it's fine. But if I paid for something, I won't feel guilty that I took it for free. It will happen once, twice, thrice, and after that, the person might feel in their heart, you know what, I'm giving one too many freebies to this particular person. It might destroy a relationship. The best thing, go there with a smile, pay the price. If you really want a discount, you ask for it. What will happen? The hadith says you might get something free. As I said, you and I know, not everyone's going to give you things free. So what will happen next is, they might put some for you. You might have a little bit of perfume that they will give you. Slight bit. Instead of getting the whole bottle, I might just get a little spray. Small spray. There are people sometimes who cannot afford perfume. You and I know what they do. What do they do? They walk past a perfume shop every morning going to test, test the perfumes so that they can go to work with a good smell. Subhanallah. I know when I walk past the airports and there's a duty free shop, a lot of the times you see people there and I sit and I wonder, are you really going to buy? But the reality is so what? At least they passed by. It said tester on there. There was some remaining. So I'm entitled to test it. No one said I'm going to buy it. I'm testing. It says testing. That's how we've become nowadays. To be honest, people are doing it with clothing and everything else as well nowadays. They go to the stall, they test all the clothing, they take all the pictures, they upload them onto Instagram and Facebook and everywhere else, pretending like they have the latest clothing, the latest shoes, new pair every day. They don't know, I just visited another store. May Allah forgive us. So the third thing that would happen is you would get a good smell. In fact, if I were to put it in the order, firstly, he may give it to you. Secondly, you might buy some from him. And you know, it's a good price because your friend won't cheat you, I hope. Your friend won't cheat you, inshallah. So you know you've bought something at a good price. Thirdly, 
you will get a good smell you enter how beautiful do you feel when you have a good smell lovely scent imagine you enter a home you feel a beautiful air condition and at the same time you take a deep breath and you tell yourself mashallah sit down and you're just enjoying it this is the benefit of good company the prophet sallallahu says you will benefit from them in so many ways they will leave a smell they will leave a scent there will be something that lingers well beyond their departure subhanallah well beyond them leaving you there is a smell a good person comes into your home they will help you to change your life that is a, a scent that lingers that is the fragrance that remains well beyond the person who might have left you a long time back this is the fragrance we are talking about my brothers and sisters fragrance i want you to ask yourselves do i leave a fragrance wherever i go i'm not talking about a smell a physical smell i'm talking of a beautiful islamic impression that is heading in the right direction do i leave behind a positive vibe do i leave behind some form of refreshing feeling in the hearts and minds of those whom i interact with no matter who they are or is it the opposite what's the opposite the hadith says nafiqul kir nafiqul kir is someone who blows into the iron ore if you are in his company what will happen something will happen either he will burn your clothes or you will have a foul smell from that particular burning even when you leave people will be able to smell that this person has a bad smell coming from them you know when you're in the company of smokers May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all those who smoke to quit. You see, the sisters said, I mean, louder than the brothers. I don't know why, but I, I know. Yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to eradicate all our bad habits. When I was saying the dua in my mind, I'm saying, I'm going to see who's going to say, I mean. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. If you're in the company of those who smoke, what happens? At night, when you go back home, and you smell your clothes or someone smells them you smell like you were the one smoking but you weren't and then subhanallah when it comes to the men sometimes their family members spouse or someone will say where were you where were you you are not supposed to be asking me where i was but you are giving me the idea because i can smell you head to toe you're smelling of something that's really bad you're not supposed to be smelling of it May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So this is where this whole theme has come about. The idea, my brothers and sisters, is for every one of us to be able to leave a fragrance. To be able to leave a beautiful scent. There is too much negativity going on on the globe. You know that. I know that too. What are, what are you doing to promote positivity? To let people's lives become positive? Are you reaching out to people? Are you helping the homeless? Are you reaching out to the orphans, the widows, those who don't have, the disabled and the others? When the hadith speaks about the reward that you will get if you were to assist widows and orphans for the sake of Allah, not for any other ulterior motive, solely for the sake of Allah, you are ready to sacrifice your wealth, your time and so much more in order to help people. Allah says one Subhanallah, this is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who strives, the one who strives to fulfill the needs of the widows and the orphans is similar in reward to the one who has spent the whole night in worship, meaning in prayer, and the whole day fasting every day. You want that reward? You have to go out and leave a fragrance. You have to go out and leave something that lingers. Well beyond your death, people will be making dua for you. They will be praying for you. Subhanallah. Take a look at the sick, those who are unwell, to visit them, to make dua for them. And you know, when we talk of visiting my brothers and sisters, there are etiquettes of visiting. It doesn't mean there's a sick person. So you arrive at their house eight in the morning and you sit with them up to eight in the evening saying, well, when I stay with you, then I will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's miracles. No few minutes make sure that it's the right time make sure it's okay some people it's enough to just message them that's okay for them some people are in a condition they are not in a mood of visiting people imagine the minute you say i'm not well you don't want to see 20 people at your house because then your wife will become unwell preparing tea for them may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us 
From one, it becomes two and three. You need to think. You need to use your mind. You need to understand. Don't burden people. You visit them. Yes, I'm visiting the sick. Why? Just to make a dua for them. If it's possible, I might message them. It will be enough. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. The point is to reach out to them in a way that they feel reassured. There are people concerned about me. Today I am here. Wallahi for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I may not know you personally. I may have seen some of you perhaps on social media. It's possible. I'm also a human being. I may have seen you. But a personal relationship perhaps very few I would know. But I'm here for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For exactly the same fragrance that I am striving to leave behind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all learn and understand. So when we visit the sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his help, his assistance, his guidance, and all forms of mercy descend upon a person who is concerned about those who are sick and those who are ill. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us reach out to one another. Today, if you take a look at the globe, everyone is searching for one thing. Do you know what it is? Happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy. And guess what? Everyone has a recipe for that happiness, but not necessarily correct. But they all have a recipe. You know, it reminds me of baking. It reminds me of baking. When you bake, yes, you have the ingredients. Number one. Number two is you have the recipe. Number three is you have the method. Number four is you need to know how to follow that particular method in order to get exactly what you want, how you want it. If not, your cake is going to flop. Beautiful, you bought all the ingredients, you spent money, you read it, you did this, you did that. But last minute, you know, you put all the, the ingredients in properly, but you kept on opening the oven to make sure everything is okay. What happens? The sisters and the brothers who might be bakers. Before, I just used to say sisters who are bakers. Now I've acknowledged there are brothers also who are good bakers, mashallah. So you would know that if you keep on opening, what happens? You're destroying that particular cake. You cannot. See, I see people nodding their heads. Yes, you open. You don't have to open. There's a little light. You just turn it on and check from outside. That's it. And if the bulb is gone, get some electrician to repair it. And if you have an oven that doesn't have a light bulb, wait, be patient. Wait until it's, you know, enough time. You've allowed enough time. And then you might want to quickly look into it. The idea is you need to have the correct recipe so that the cake can be exactly how you want it. And guess what? You would agree with me that sometimes you have modified the recipe to the, in a way that it becomes better than the original recipe that's there. It happens because you've spent time. You've actually improved. If someone has taught you something, it's possible that there comes a time when you become a bigger teacher than your original teacher. It's possible. It's very possible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. So there are so many recipes to achieve happiness. Some of them say, when you take a drug or when you drink alcohol, you will become happy. For a little while, you forget absolutely everything that's been happening in my life. You know, why? Because I'm high. I'm high, high. When I was young, they used to say hi to greet, you know, hi. When we grew a little bit older, when a person was not in their mind, they said, he's high. May Allah forgive us. I wonder what they're trying to say. Hi, meaning with a GH, that means you're now cloud nine. You're out of reality. Drugs is never the solution for your problems. It might temporarily make you feel like you're above the ground. But to be honest with you, you are not flying. Remember that. The same with alcohol. I know people who drink and then they come and say, you know, you look like a rich man. I say, well, you must be richer than me because you've got money to throw away. People who smoke. And I always tell them, you've got money to blow. Subhanallah. You've got money to burn. You're foolish. Guys like us are saving every penny in order to ensure that our families are living comfortably or that we can buy a house perhaps, or maybe we can do something and perhaps be charitable also with the wealth. Whereas there are others who are drinking, perhaps they're on drugs. They gamble their money thinking they're going to get more. That brings about more problem. Did happiness come through drugs for anyone? Not one person. My dearest brothers and sisters, never. That is a path of destruction. It is not the true ingredient. It is a path of chaos. 
the chaos that we are talking about that is part of it it causes destruction the same applies to any other bad habit take a look at adultery for example people might think wow I'm you know it's something good because people might think it's something good because it, I achieve something from it wallahi that is the devil making you feel that you've achieved something it is unclean it is impure and it will only come back to you with chaos you want to know why we're in chaos we're in chaos because we've turned away from purity that's what it is you want to be pure you need to purify yourself start with your heart your heart needs to realize point number one I need to develop a link with the one who made me I need to worship him alone that's there point number one I'm sure he sent messengers in fact he has and I need to follow those messengers in order to make sure that I am content I'm happy because that is the only ingredient of happiness the only recipe of happiness that has actually brought about true happiness and it has brought about an end to the chaos that we've been in if not guess what happens as you're growing older you look into the mirror and you start noticing I have a pimple on my face and what happens well I want to make Calvin Klein rich that's all or I want to make someone else rich by buying all sorts of things and listen I'm not picking on makeup at all but I'm picking on the way it's being done today that's a reality the way it's being done today is such that it has resulted in chaos across the globe people are depressed they cannot come to the door without painting their faces they will not be able to even go to school without looking like someone they are not subhanallah where is the peace how long is this going to last wallahi be happy with what you look like for indeed that will become a point of comfort and peace a point of happiness don't worry someone somewhere will really adore you for exactly who you are you don't need to prove to the world that you are blemishless we all have blemishes we all have bent noses we all have teeth that are not in order we all have something here and there that is Allah's way of letting you know that you are a human being here for a bigger purpose our life has been reduced to worrying about cosmetics males included not just the females subhanallah like I said I'm not attacking makeup because to a certain point with certain conditions yes it may be there but I'm talking of the the way it is progressing nowadays how it is developing people are going beyond the limits it brings about chaos in our lives because I know of cases as a counselor where there are some wives who don't allow their husbands to see them without makeup. A'udhu billah. Why did I marry you, man? Why did I marry you? Subhanallah. Imagine what would happen if he cannot see you because you don't have makeup. Now that you have makeup, I guess he cannot touch you. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. Where will it end? My brothers and sisters, as you will notice from what I'm saying, as you will realize, sometimes the chaos from a certain angle, and I will be speaking about it from a few different angles, but from a certain angle is chaos within us, within the individual. There is chaos in my heart. I don't have happiness. I don't have contentment. I'm not calm. Everything is chaotic. I'm running from pillar to post. I don't know what I want. You know why? Sometimes materialism has taken over our hearts. So purify the heart. You don't need to have the latest. You don't need to stand out such that you are the best and the top. No, in the eyes of Allah, you will always be the best in your own unique way. In your own unique way, you are definitely the best. What is your relationship with Allah? Do you really fulfill your salah? If you don't, how do you want that happiness? How do you want your heart to become pure? You have not gotten up for Salatul Fajr in so many days, in so many months. You have not even picked up the Quran in so many months as well. The last time was the previous Ramadan. 
How do you want that internal chaos to be dealt with when you haven't even thought about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In Islam, we are taught to dress modestly. We are taught to dress modestly. This modest dressing is not just for the females. It is for the males as well. And we are taught to be of high character, conduct, values, and so on. This modest dress is supposed to calm us. It is supposed to bring about a sense of peace, a sense of equality. Whether you are rich or poor, whether you are fair or dark in complexion, Allah loves you. Remember that. And Allah loves you. An unmatched love. It's up to you to reciprocate that. Remember my words. Allah loves you. But do you love Allah? That's the question. People say Allah doesn't love me. If someone says that, it's because they don't love Allah. That's the reason. Allah loves you. Do you love Allah? If the answer is yes, how can you give up your prayer? How can you start exposing yourself? I remember someone asked me a question. And I'm taking the liberty of answering it here because I think it's absolutely important. Why would Allah judge? This was the question, right? Why would Allah judge you based on your dress? Why do I need to cover my hair or my legs? Why would Allah actually judge me based on whether my legs are covered or my hair is covered? Do you see? These are the questions of today. So I said, for the same reason that he would judge you if you prayed or not, if you stole or not, if you did anything else or not. These are rules and regulations. You call yourself a Muslim. What is the meaning of a Muslim? Islam is generally interpreted in two different ways. Coming from istislam, which means to surrender and to submit. Surrender. Who surrendered? Anyone who wants to call themselves Muslim, it means they have surrendered. If they don't want to surrender, well, stop calling yourself a Muslim. But today they want to say, I'm a Muslim and I won't surrender. It's a different thing if you have a weakness. If you're weak and you know that, look, I'm supposed to be doing this, but I'm weak. Oh Allah, forgive me. Then you are a sinful person, perhaps, or you are struggling to do the right thing. But if you are a defiant person and you say, I'm a Muslim, but who says alcohol is haram? I'm a Muslim. Who says gambling is haram? I'm a Muslim. Who says adultery is haram? If that's the case, please, you can do what you want because you are answerable to Allah, but don't call yourself a Muslim because you have not submitted to Allah and you want to change the deen. That's what people are trying to do today. They want to change the deen in a way that they will bring about things that are not in the deen into the deen and say it's the deen. And they want to remove things from the deen and say that's the deen. And if you are sticking to the straight and narrow, they will call you an extremist perhaps. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. We need to develop ourselves. I cannot shove down your throat anything. I can only encourage you. And if you see me doing wrong, you can encourage me. And even if you don't see me doing something wrong, it's your duty to, to tell me, to encourage me, to remind me. Alhamdulillah. So people are doing things that are unacceptable and saying they are part of Islam. I was saying that there are two things. One is to submit and two is Peace. I'm sure we've all heard Islam means peace. You heard that? Islam means peace. And others will say Islam means to submit and surrender. The reality is it means both of them. You submit and surrender and you will achieve peace. No submission, no surrender, no achievement of peace. What does that mean? Allah's come with a recipe. He's given it to us through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's amazing. It's unique. It's something that is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do we do? We know it. We read it, we hear it, but we couldn't really be bothered. And we're still searching for peace. We're still searching for peace. Subhanallah. The peace is there. Fulfill your prayer. Wallahi, I promise you, my brothers and sisters. And this is a challenge for myself and yourselves. I promise you and I challenge you. Get up for Salatul Fajr early. Early. Considering it an honor. Try it. Consider it an honor. Set your clock 4.30, for example. And you know salah perhaps will only be at quarter past five in the masjid, or I don't need to read salah up to just before sunrise. One might argue and they might say that. But the challenge is to get up early. Get up really early for the sake of your maker. I love him. I'm going to get up at 4.30 for him. I love him. I'm going to get up at 4.30. And you know what? 
He tells us the rules and regulations I have stipulated for you are actually for your benefit. I don't want from you anything. I don't want from them any sustenance. I don't want anything from them, nor do I want them to feed me. It's not about materialism. Allah says, I don't need your wealth. I don't need that particular food. In fact, in Allah, Allah says, indeed, it is Allah who is the provider, the all powerful. It is Allah who is the provider. He will provide for you. Develop a link with him. Become friends with him. Get close to him. How? I will get up early for Salatul Fajr. I will make wudu. I will cleanse myself. And I will stand up in prayer, considering it an honor. Wallahi, I promise you, you will achieve peace in your heart for the rest of that day. Wallahi. Have, have we felt that? Have we felt it? I, I hear quite a few yeses, but we want to hear a few more yeses as well in the future. You get up for the sake of Allah. If you are ready to get up even before that and read Salatul Tahajjud or at least make dua to Allah, pray, supplicate to Him at that time of the morning, you will achieve a lot of peace, a lot of comfort. Even though you will have challenges, by the way, who on earth does not have challenges? Who does not have difficulties? We think that we are on earth and life is supposed to be rosy. No way. Even a rose has thorns. You know that? So if your life is supposed to be rosy, well, I might say, okay, it is. But these two, three things are just the thorns in the path. So what you have to do, make the most of the smell, the scent, mashallah, the rose, enjoy what it looks like. But once in a while, you might be injured. There might be a little bit of blood here. What I mean is, things may not happen exactly the way you want it. Not everything can be smooth as you wish and as you want. Subhanallah. But what you do need to know is, life will be full of tests from the beginning to the end. And Allah says that. You were created to be tested. That's all. So what happens in a test? You have questions that are difficult. They cannot be easy all the time. You have situations to resolve that will not be so easy. They will be difficult. But Allah says, spend a few more years there. And inshallah, you will get contentment. The Prophet says, the affairs of a true believer are amazing. They are strange in a unique, beautiful, positive way. Why? Because when something good happens, then a believer is thankful, so it's better for that believer. And when something bad happens to them, they bear patience. They are still content. They surrender to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so they are still happy. Many of us, we're not happy with the decree of Allah. Allah chose that you will have this. You say, no, I don't want it. Well, you're not going to be able to change it. That's Allah. If he gave you hair in a certain way, a face in a certain way, if he gave you a complexion in a certain way, that's his choice. You cannot say, I'm upset with Allah. Allah chose your parents for you. There is nothing you're going to be able to do about changing that. Zero. That's something, in fact, you cannot even change. Those are your parents. They're a test for you and you're a test for them. One might say, how am I a test for my parents? I can explain. So many things might happen to you in your life. Can I give you a hot topic? Something that's really happening amongst the people today. You know, Islam obviously has grown far and wide and the globe has become a little village you agree with the internet so your child wants to marry someone who doesn't belong to your tribe or your color or your group or your little circle and so on and you need to know what do i do well if you don't follow the guidance that allah has set your peace is snatched there will be chaos there will be chaos in your life in their lives in everyone else's life because you did not follow the guidance but if you follow the guidance the chaos will be gone everything will be gone and subhanallah you lead a peaceful life what is the guidance if someone proposes a person a proposal has come forth from someone whose deen level of religion is okay their character is acceptable then let them get married so long as the both parties are happy both the bride and the groom to be are happy let it happen if you don't now the hadith is saying if you block it what will happen 
تكن فتنة في الأرض وفساد عريض. There will be great fitna on earth, chaos on earth, and great corruption, fasad. Lots of unwanted things. Your health, your family is broken to pieces. No one speaks to each other. People are depressed. People are sick. They go to the hospitals. They are dying because of this and that. Only because, you know what? They wanted to marry halal, legal. Okay, it was fine. Nothing wrong with it. You blocked it because what will people say? What will people say? That's the reason. What is my family going to say? Sorry? On the day of judgment, is Allah going to ask you, what did your family say? What did your group say? What did your people say? Break the trend. Come on. Let it happen. The others will follow you. There are tens of thousands in the same boat. They are willing to go forth. They just need someone to lead by example. So how was it a test? A parent who denies that right for their child has failed their test in the eyes of Allah. They need to know that. Their whole idea of my son, my daughter, when they, when they were born, we had a aqiqah for them. We called people. We had a party. We named them. All that was, by the way, you failed your test when it came to you. Subhanallah. It is not easy to let go of your child, but Allah teaches you from the very beginning that the control you have of that newborn will diminish as time passes such that they will come in age when you have nothing to do with them besides what you've already trained them towards if it was good. Let me give you an example. Your little, who names you? Your parents. Who clothed you? Your parents. Obviously, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who clothes, but he used your parents. What type of toys were given to you? Your parents decided. A little bit later, you didn't want those toys because they were too old-fashioned for me, who's a sophisticated person. Now three years old, they can no longer give you a rattle because a rattle is for someone who's only six months. Up to six months, they can use a rattle. After that, we, know we want something more sophisticated. So let the mom come and give a rattle. See what happens. I don't want it. Why? Come on, man. You're giving me a rattle. I want your phone. Give me your iPhone. Now the kids know, you know, I've seen this with my own eyes, mashallah. I have a passcode on my phone, not because I have something to hide. My family knows it. But at the same time, it's because the little children mustn't tamper and start tweeting, you know, silly things on behalf of myself from my own device. So what happens? My little daughter, two and a half, she knows my passcode. That's it. You know, it's a little design. How old? She just speaks a little bit. And here she is. She can pick the phone up and open it. Whoa, I'm shocked. When I was little, I don't know. Now when I think about it, it makes me feel like I was thick. Yes, I, yet I wasn't. Yet I wasn't. But technology wasn't up to scratch. Or it wasn't up to what it is today. And trust me, it's going to keep on changing. And it's going to keep on updating itself. And becoming more and more sophisticated. The point is, your control over your child becomes less and less as time passes. And you notice, when the child is little, you clothe the child. When the child grows a little bit older, they will make tantrums in order not to wear certain clothing. I don't want to wear this. That's it. I'm not wearing this. I'm wearing that. I'm doing this. I want to do that. When they're little, you send them to the schools. When they grow a little bit older, I don't want to go to the school anymore. I want to go to another school. When they grow even older, what's happening? What's happening? Allah is showing you the child is a test. While you can mold them, mold them. When the cement is wet or when the iron is hot, you mold it. Subhanallah. You don't wait until everything's become cold and then you want to start molding. No. By, by that time, it's too late. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us as time is passing, you are getting your control over the child is less and less. Why? Because the child belongs to us, not to you. The child belongs to Allah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We all belong to Allah and we are all going to return back to Allah. So myself as a parent, if my child wants to do something, I need to ask myself, is it permissible or not? Does Allah allow it or not? Is it okay or not? Is my blocking of it permissible or not? And I need to take cue from that. I do not do things according to my whims, my fancies, what I perceive my culture as being. If it is a negative culture, no way. You know, culture is acknowledged in Islam for as long as it does not trample over the toes of the rules and regulations we have. But many a time people look at Islam as a bad religion, not because of Islam, 
but because of the culture that we've cl we've we're clinging on to in a way that it gives that a bad name a lot of the cultures we are in wallahi they promote racism they promote tribalism they promote various other lines that are actually not there in islam islam has taught us that the color you are the tribe you belong to and wherever else you may be in terms of complexion etc all that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just in order that you recognize one another. Allah says to recognize one another. What does that mean? If I look at you, I see you again some other time. Oh, I saw you. Where did I see you? Somewhere. But if we all looked exactly identical, it would be boring. If everyone sounded the same and everyone looked the same, what would happen? Life would be boring. Subhanallah. We would need number plates, like I once said. We would need number plates. Subhanallah, just like motor vehicles, they all look the same. How do we distinguish them? Well, through the number plates. And if you're lucky, through the color. So all those lines are there for a reason. Learn the reason, understand it, and don't go beyond it. Don't think for a moment someone else is lower than you. No. And don't think for a moment that you are lower than someone else. No. In the eyes of Allah, there are equal opportunities for everyone. Subhanallah. Everyone equal opportunities. It's up to you to seize that you get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, we need to deal with the chaos within ourselves by eradicating this love for materialistic items that would not last long. When you came to the earth, you came bare hands, bare feet. You had nothing on. You were clothed when you came. When you left the earth, you left without anything. Whatever was there remained behind. So it was just a test from point A to point B. If it was anything beyond the test, Allah would have given us much more than 70 years. The average lifespan is 70 years. We should not spend it running behind materialistic items in a way that we've compromised our link with the one whom we are going to go back to. I'm not saying it's wrong to earn. I'm not saying it's wrong to have nice things. But what we are saying is not at the expense of your hereafter. No way. Not at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us blessings. Now let's move on to another aspect of chaos. One was the chaos within. Inshallah, we will eradicate the jealousy, the envy, the hatred, perhaps the racist feelings that we may have and so many other things that we may feel we, we will eradicate them we will work on them we will develop our link with Allah when your salah is in order when your link with Allah is in order then what happens you tend to respect other people you tend to respect other people becoming religious a sign of it is your heart is softened towards the rest look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he was the best of creation, the most noble of prophets, the highest in rank. But he was calm. He treated people with utmost respect. Even those who swore him, he never swore back at them. Those who said bad things about him, he did not say bad things about them in return. He was calm. He was relaxed. He always seized the opportunity to do good in Ta'if when he was... May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. In Ta'if, when the Prophet ﷺ was chased and he was harmed, do you know what happened? The angels came to say, we can crush these people. He said, no, not at all, not at all. Oh Allah, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh Allah, guide their offspring if you haven't written guidance for them. Subhanallah. Look at how the heart is softened because of its closeness to Allah. The same will apply with us. If you are becoming hard and your heart is developing hatred and animosity against your fellow believers and against others, remember, it's a sign of your distance from Allah. No matter how much you are praying, there is something wrong with the sincerity and perhaps the intention. Something is wrong. What's the point of someone who comes to pray in the mosque only to show people that I'm praying? I'm in the first saf. Look, I've been here for 20 years, so on. You know, we go for Hajj and Umrah. MashaAllah, we do it for the sake of Allah. And you may have a count of how much you've done, but you didn't go in order to count. So someone says, you made Umrah? Yes, 25 times. I didn't ask you how many times. That's now between you and Allah. So don't let the number become an issue. Let the sincerity become the issue. And that is when it will help you to cleanse the heart. 
But like I was saying, another aspect of chaos, my brothers and sisters, is the chaos within Muslims. The chaos amongst ourselves. What is happening? Each one says, I'm on the straight path, the rest of them are out. They are out of the fold of Islam, they are not Muslim, they are kuffar. They are what? Kuffar. It is happening in our midst, it's a problem we need to tackle. And we need to tackle it fairly. We need to tackle it justly. We need to understand revelation comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who brought it to us? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No doubt that in order, the hierarchy, it starts off Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter. We cannot deny that. That is what makes us Muslimin. So if I have a problem, If you truly believe in Allah in the last day, when you have a dispute, when there is an argument about something, you go back to what Allah said. What did the messenger say? That's what it is. You go back to that. So we do agree that there is a way of doing things, but later on you find, subhanallah, one picks on the other, this one picks on that one. Do you realize everything is a test from Allah? You have the right to propagate. You have the right to communicate. You have the right to put forward your view and the reasons why it is your view. You have the evidence, you put it. You don't have the evidence, you might want to present whatever logic it is, whatever else it is. But you need to know you don't need to become violent. You don't need to become hurtful and hateful. You will propagate. I will propagate. I will tell you what I believe is correct. And I will tell you why I believe that what I believe is correct. I will present for you the reasons. And if you're not convinced, so what? You're not convinced I'm a human being. Your answer is to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ was told in the Quran, in alayka illa al Your duty is to convey the message, not more than that. And in another place, Allah says, فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ وَعَلَيْنَ الْحِسَابُ your duty is to deliver the message and our duty is the accounts. We will take account. We will judge the people. You just deliver the message. Don't judge them. Deliver the message. I don't know who from amongst you is closer to Allah than I am. And I don't even know how you have responded to the call of Allah because there are more than 100 million teachings of Islam. Because you are not following the 10 that I am following, I suddenly think that you are astray. You might be adopting another 10 that I've never even thought of. Subhanallah. I do agree. The core matters of belief are of utmost importance. But then again, discuss it, propagate it, give it to people. And do not become a person who is violent. Do not become hurtful and hateful by saying words that will crumble this entire ummah. We have a billion, two billion people on the globe. But subhanallah, where are we heading? Have you ever thought about it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We are dealing with a crisis. If you go onto the internet today, and I'm sure all of you have been on there, you will notice this one speak bad about that one, that one called this one a kafir, and this one called that one a deviant, and this one called that one this, rather than positive propagation. Where are we? If you really believe someone is wrong, there is no harm in presenting what you believe is right. And also presenting evidence as to what you believe is wrong. But sometimes you haven't even given them the opportunity to clarify their stance. You haven't even given them a chance to even say why they may have said what they have said. And sometimes they may not even have said what you think they have said. It could just be an issue of clip and paste, cut and paste. Or as you know, the editors of videos and voiceovers and so on all of that can be the case but what did we do we started hating on individuals in a way that we don't even know who they are what did we we complain when the media passes judgment before the court you know when there is a case going on in the court sometimes the newspaper already passes a judgment by saying this person is guilty and that person is this and that person is like this and we complain about it but we do it in our own lives without giving someone a chance someone sometimes you don't even know you start hating on them why 
just because that person is like this and like that. No. If you would like to communicate, do so. If you would like to propagate, do so. If you believe you are on the right path, you have every right to communicate it and propagate it. It's a human right to propagate what you believe is right. That is your right. No one can take it away from you. And it's your duty as a Muslim also to convey. The Prophet ﷺ says, بَلِّغُوا anni وَلَوْ aya." Convey the message. This is an instruction. Even if it means one verse that you know, convey it. So it's your duty to convey the verses, the messages. But it's not your duty. In fact, it is haram to go out and spread chaos in an already suffering ummah. So I hope my message is clear. When dealing with chaos amongst members of the ummah, we need to be positive about our approach. If you notice those who talk to you, there are some whom, when they speak to you, you begin to hate individuals and you begin to want to beat them up. Sometimes some, a'udhu billah, they will actually drive you to a point where you want to kill someone else. If that is the case, they are not religious. That's not the deen. That's not what Allah wants. But if someone makes you hate what is bad, then they are on the right path. Are you getting my point? If someone makes you hate what is unacceptable and what is bad, then they're on the right path. But I don't need to talk about a specific individual without giving them a proper opportunity and so on. It's something serious because we are struggling on the globe. We are becoming fragmented into bigger, in fact, into a larger number of fragments. Each one of them smaller than the previous one. And enemies trampling over us completely. People are trying to eradicate the whole of Islam as a result of the actions of a few misguided people. So now there's a problem with hijab. When there was never a problem with hijab. And hijab is not actually the problem. But people are sitting behind the scenes seizing the opportunity of our disunity to talk about things that seem so absurd to us and try and find fault with that which has no fault in it. Just because... We are all in pieces. No one is speaking on our behalf. And no one does. And even those who do, we don't recognize them. We don't understand them. We don't appreciate the sacrifice they actually make for that. So the message I have for you today is, purify your belief as well. Purify it. But it should come about with calmness, with love of Allah. Cleanse yourself. Worship Allah alone. Protect yourself from innovation. Without a doubt, that is there, that's primary. But at the same time, what you should do is spread peace and goodness. Learn to respect others. Learn to respect others. Subhanallah. Part of the problem I'm talking of within the ummah is that we don't know how to propagate the deen. We've left the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it comes to the propagation of the deen. It was never propagated in a violent way. Never. If the wars happened, they happened for reasons. And yes, there is a whole study in that regard. But what has been happening in the last decade, decade and a half, two decades, subhanallah, it is taking a turn whereby the whole world is beginning to think that Islam is a religion of violence, hatred, blood and killing. That's it. And we know that that's not true. We know it. We've lived by it. I'm sure in our midst, there are non-Muslims seated with us today. I'm sure they feel safe here in our midst. Why? Goes to prove we're not just a bunch of terrorists. Astaghfirullah. It goes to prove we're peaceful people. We've been living, serving the nation, serving so many different places, serving humanity at large, ultimately, obviously serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these are our duties and responsibilities as human beings. Why you are seated here today is because there are so many people who work so hard to get this thing happening. We appreciate them. We might have differences with them. We might not agree with everything they do in their lives. But they are our brothers and sisters. They are our brothers in humanity. They are. We should spread the love. It doesn't mean someone says, Assalamu alaikum, and you just spit in that direction and walk away. No. Re reply back. I would rather make a, make a mistake to reply back than to make a mistake to spit because that, there's no way that it's correct. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum, reply, wa alaikum as -salam. I don't need to judge them in your heart. No, the thing is, you know, I, I can't reply this person because um, some basic small thing a lot of the times. Something that is petty. I remember 
in one city in the in the UK there was one sheikh who said he had very strong views about women who drive listen carefully he had strong views about women who drive cars and he felt it was unacceptable okay that's his opinion I might disagree with it it's his opinion he's entitled to it I don't think he's convinced many people in that regard but entitled to his opinion I don't need to harm him go and slap him arrange for people to go and kill him just because of that it doesn't need to happen it's something it's his opinion the women are still going to drive anyway so that was his opinion as a result of it he became very passionate and he said it is haram to greet a woman who drives okay that was a fatwa he issued okay haram to greet a woman who drives so what happened is someone contacted a relative of mine by phone uh, ladies women and they happened on the telephone to say hello how are you what's happening how's things going you know I wanted to speak to you because of this exercise class that we are going to so this sister happened to say hang on hang on start off with a salamu alaikum right so the other sister says wait our sheikh told us not to greet women who drive and you drive <laughs> so this sister said well what that sheikh must have meant is don't even greet them don't even greet them means don't even talk to them communicate to them the point I'm raising is my brothers and sisters to go to that level where you have to talk to them you have some interaction with them but you cannot start with salam that is low that is cheap that is unacceptable that is unacceptable assalamu qabl al kalam before you talk greet say something I came onto the podium here. How did I start? Signature beginning. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I truly mean it because it's a dua. It means I pray for you. I pray for you that Allah grant you peace. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. That's what I said. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. I started off that way. May you be at peace externally internally and in every way your surroundings your inside outside everything religiously financially everything else by that dua assalamu alaikum perhaps you will also be able to pay your debts so that's why i keep on saying assalamu alaikum subhanallah because then you had more peace isn't it so for us to go about the muslim ummah telling people that you know what don't greet them. how am i going to give them da'wah you know what is da'wah propagation how am i going to propagate to them when i'm not going to talk to them I'm not going to talk to you. How am I going to propagate the message to you? I need to talk to you. I need to tell you. I need to develop a relationship with you. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uniquely, do you know what he did? The enemies in Makkah al Mukarramah, he treated them so well that a lot of them, they were blown away by his character and conduct. They knew this is a messenger of Allah. He is a Rasul. He is a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They accepted the faith as a result. I'm not going to give you detailed examples, but I'm sure a few examples must be coming to your mind. How beautiful he was in character. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. Then we have another aspect of chaos. What is the other aspect of chaos, my brothers and sisters? The non-Muslims perception of the Muslims of today. It's become such that it makes it difficult for peace-loving Muslims to live as Muslims in many countries on the globe because people now think that the Muslims are not exactly what they are portraying themselves to be but rather they are violent they have this hidden element of terror in them and that's not true that is absolutely unacceptable if you see a man with a beard it does not mean he wants to blow up the next place not at all if you see a sister in hijab in niqab or if you see a, a person who's covered from top to bottom, it doesn't mean they are violent or they are extremists. Not at all. We have upheld our Islamic values and we have served humanity dedicatedly. We've served nations. We have progressed and we've achieved so much. From amongst us are the intellectuals. From amongst us are those who pray five times a day. They dress appropriately and they have served so much. They've reached out to so many people non-muslims as well and this is the majority those who perhaps might be perpetrating heinous crimes they are a small percentage very small percentage so my brothers and sisters it makes it even more important for us to live as true muslims 
it makes it very important for us to go out of our way to portray the good teachings of Islam. I can give you one example from my own life and it's happened a lot. I try my best and I hope that we all do try and I'm sure in fact that we do in our own way but increase it inshallah, increase the goodness, reach out to people, they will see the goodness of Islam. I happened to land at an airport and the carousel, we were waiting for the bags and I saw two nuns, elderly nuns, they were waiting for their bags. What did I do? Take a guess. I actually went out to them and I greeted them and I offered help. I got a little trolley. I took out their bags. I put them on this uh, trolley and I pushed the trolley out through the customs for them. Subhanallah. I was with them. Two nuns walking behind a sheikh. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. It looks dodgy, doesn't it? it? Looks very dodgy. But all I'm saying is, Wallahi, at the end, they were so, so touched. They actually said a few things. They were, they told me, you know what? We've changed our whole perspective. And then they asked me, who are you? What's your name? And so on. And I gave them my first name. And I told, they said, no, but there's something about you. And I said, what is it? Maybe my beard? And they said, no. And I said, well, look, you know what? I actually, I'm a preacher. I'm a Muslim leader. I'm one of the Muslim, you know, I preach Islam and goodness. And they looked at each other like this, like they were shocked. That's not what they knew. That's not what they knew. So if someone who's looked at as a leader can do that, I wonder what the people who actually follow would do. Subhanallah. And why did I do it? Just because they were human beings. Wallahi, I didn't intend to earn brownie points or anything. I've done it hundreds of times. I, I don't even know the types of people that I've tried to help. And I have helped. And I'm not telling you because I want to show off. But I'm telling you because consider it a duty as Muslims. Muhammad sallallahu did it before us. We are following his example truly. Those people are the ones who will turn to Islam. Take a look at big names in the Islamic arena. A lot of them sometimes were leaders of other churches who saw the beauty in Islam. Take a look at Yusuf Estes, for example. Who was he? Find out what happened to him. How did his life change? Take a look at Pictol, for example. Who was he? Where was he? How did his life change? These were religious leaders belonging to other faiths. They suddenly became religious leaders belonging to Islam because of someone who tried with them, someone who reached out to them, someone who understood that even if they are not Muslim, so what? I'm reaching out to them. They are human beings. I need to still smile, speak with respect, understand. And you know what? I don't need to curse people like this. So that is my message. When dealing with the chaos of that level, you need to be of sound character and conduct and you need to be very patient. There will be people who don't like you. I want to give you one other example. I won't give you every detail, but I will tell you it happened with me. I was on an aircraft, okay? And it was a Western aircraft. And I was sitting and I saw a family walk in, boarding. This happened not too long ago. And I've been reading stories about how Muslims are asked to leave the plane. Wallahi, it's happened to a lot of people, especially in the Western world where anything, you know, if you say on the phone, someone said, Inshallah, Alhamdulillah, and someone reported them that these people are murmuring Arabic murmurings, they were told to get off the plane. Wallahi, I'm not joking. It's become ridiculous. This is the chaos we are talking about as well. It's become ridiculous. So just be careful. Just be careful. So anyway, I was on this aircraft and Wallahi, I was shocked because I saw a family come towards me and they were divided into two. Some of them came on this side of the aisle and the others were on this side of the aisle, perhaps where their seats were. And a young boy must be about four years old. He looked at me and he immediately called out to his dad on the other side. Dad, I'm scared straight. <laughs> and I was shocked because now my heart started pumping a bit faster. First time happening to me. Dad, I'm scared. I'm scared. Dad, I'm scared. And I told myself I need to fix this little boy in such a way that I don't raise alarm. Because now, soon, the cabin attendants will come. Child is scared. Sir, please, can you disembark? The, the, the other passengers are not feeling safe with you on the plane. It seemed to me that the child, may Allah forgive me, but it seemed to me that the child may have been trained to do that. Wallahu a'lam. Because so confident and came in, unless the child read stories or seen movies or whatever else, I don't know. But... Dad, I'm scared. I said, hey, hang on. What's happening, man? I know your dad. We were in school together, man. 
we were, and he looked at me, he says, serious? I said, yeah, man, relax, cool, cool down, sit down, man. He said, oh, that's okay, that's cool. He sat down, calm, the father was still putting the bags, didn't notice anything, the doors closed, the plane took off a little while later, son goes to dad, you know that man? He says, no, I don't. <laughs> May Allah forgive me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. But it, saw, it, go, it, it, it obviously solved the problem. And it goes to show that subhanallah, there is, a, there is chaos out there. We need to sort something out. Luckily, I was a little bit quick in the way I thought. I said, hey, I know your dad from school days, man. From school days. In my mind, I meant, you know, I know a lot of non-Muslims from school days. Okay, okay. You know, you might say, stop justifying the lie. Okay, let's leave it. It was a lie, okay? But at the same time, it's chaotic. It's a problem. It's an issue that we were dealing with. Subhanallah. I had to deal with it myself. I was in the position. And I was thinking, as soon as I heard it, I said, that's it. I better start getting ready to be, you know, to be offloaded from this plane and so on. But subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us a way. And I just said something. And the child was calm, straight away, within seconds, cool, calm. What did it need? Speaking. Please, I'm not justifying telling a, telling a lie. I mean, may Allah forgive me, but I'm letting you know, these are real life problems. We have faced them. I know of a family going on holiday and they were told, you know, you know, you have to get off. For what reason? Someone somewhere somehow was perhaps saying that, you know, there's a Muslim family in here. My brothers and sisters, we are fortunate in our countries. We are fortunate that we have a good relationship with authorities. And this is why it's important to engage authority. It's important to engage them in a positive way. Some people think, you know what, when I fight authority, then I'm going to gain what I want. That's not how it works. You need to engage them and convince them and try with them again. And you, you need to know that we will probably have to get the numbers in order to be able to ensure that legislation does not deprive the Muslims of fulfilling what they have to. And we need to appreciate that that is the case in most African countries. We are, we are free to practice our deen in such a beautiful, unique way. In order to preserve that, learn from the lessons of others preserve that by learning from the lessons of others those who are struggling as a result of a handful of people perpetrating crimes in the name of the deen that that same deen does not teach so if you see this morning or this afternoon we've discussed three different aspects of chaos and i've presented a few ways of dealing with this chaos firstly we spoke about the internal chaos and before that I dwelt for a few moments on the fragrance and how important it is to develop ourselves to the degree that whoever you interact with, whoever it is, you leave behind something. They will think to themselves, wow, I met a really blessed person. Say good things about one another behind their backs, behind our backs. You want to say something, say something decent, especially within family. Subhanallah. Don't break the family unit. Today, the chaos starts off inside and then the small circle, husband, wife, and then the parents and children, and then brothers and sisters, and then uncles and aunts, and suddenly the in-laws come into the whole equation and make matters worse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So we dwelt on the fragrance, we spoke about the internal chaos, we spoke about the inter-Muslim chaos, and we spoke about the interfaith chaos that we are having. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to deal with this, because with His help, we can deal with anything and everything. Remember, when dealing with a problem, do not employ something that will create a bigger problem as a solution. Because it won't solve the matter. When dealing with a problem, it will require lots of sabr. In Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with those who bear patience. Allah is with those who endure. It will require wisdom. Whoever's been given wisdom has been given a lot of goodness. Allah says, when calling towards the path of the Almighty, call with a lot of wisdom and with a good reminder, a good way of reminding people. There needs to be wisdom. 
So this is how we will be able to resolve the matters. I call on you once again to develop your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by worshipping Him alone, by considering it an honor to fulfill the obligations that He has placed upon you. And wallahi, through those obligations, you will find a lot of peace, a lot of comfort, a lot of happiness that the whole world is searching for. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله الخير brothers and sisters I think the message is loud and clear I don't wish to dilute whatever has been said going forward we are going to have a vote of thanks from one of the organizers of this event and then inshallah we shall ask you to stay behind and request our guests Mufti Ismail Musamank to move to the other hall. Brothers and sisters, you are aware that we have had to arrange for two halls. This being the primary hall, we also have a secondary hall. You have been honored to have seen him in flesh and also in ruh. The other brothers and sisters have been following him through the screens. It's only fair that they also see him. So we'll ask you to stay behind. Inshallah the Sheikh will move across the other hall. Probably just have a five to ten minutes address there. And then once we are done, we'll request you to depart in an orderly manner. We will start with the brothers, and you're going to have ushers. So we'll start with the top row coming down. And once the brothers are done, then the sisters also will move out slowly. They will be guided by our ushers. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give tawfiq in the message that we have received today. And inshallah, hope to see you tomorrow. But before that, our elder, our brother, and none other than Honorable Najib Balala will come forward, inshallah, to give a word of thanks to those who have made this possible by the tawfiq of Allah and also you who have been here. So, my beloved brother, please. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm humbled to stand here on your behalf to thank a Sheikh Mufti Menk for accepting to come to Kenya. He was here about four years ago when we opened Masjid al Rahma at Halingam and it was a surprise visit without publicizing it. But I believe and now know that after that visit he became even more popular and today we value his summons. Alhamdulillah, it was not easy to get all the logistics and also to get him out of his busy schedule to come into Kenya. But I want to thank the Parklands Mosque. I want to thank the Journey of Faith team that has always organized our, our lectures in the, year, in the month of April, and there'll be one in next year as well, and also Kenya Arab Friendship Society, and all the other Muslim organizations who we've tried to involve them and show the unity that we need. When I walked in here with Sheikh uh, Menk, I remembered my days when I was a politician. I was coming here for heated political debates and elections through party politics, through counting of elections, and I've seen this center being the center of division. Today I walked in here. I was touched with the blessings of Allah and see the center of unity 
that has brought us all together. I appreciate all of you attending today. And I want to apologize for those who we could not respond to their application to join us here today. Our fellow Muslim and sisters in Mombasa, our other brothers and sisters here in Nairobi, is because of the logistics that we had to go through. When we opened the portal for registration in Nairobi, it took three days to fulfill the 5,000 mark. In Mombasa, it took two days to fill the 3,000 mark. And when we opened the second for tomorrow, the second portal, it took 12 hours to fill. That is how we are committed. And the demography was between 18 and 29. So somebody like myself, I'm older than 29, but younger at heart. <laughs> but what also made it so significant, the majority of people who registered to come here, our sisters, the ladies, that shows our homes and families is solidly committed to our deen. And that's what we pride ourselves with. So I want to thank the ladies and our brothers for coming here. But I want also to appreciate Sheikh Mufti Menk for coming. We want to organize another one. We missed Mombasa this time, my hometown. Inshallah, we'll be able to take you to Mombasa and other towns like Malindi and Kisumu. But it was a great honor. And the knowledge you, you parted with to us today about tolerance, about respect of others. And that does not mean we are not firm with our values of Islam and our character and our religion, but also to accept and respect others too. And this is, was, was actually narrated very well by yourself. So mine is to say thank you very much and I appreciate everybody. And inshallah, tomorrow we'll be back here at 10 o'clock for the second lecture. And we thank you all for coming. Shukran. Wa jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair, brother Najib Balala. You will be able to follow Sheikh's um, address from here. So we ask you to stay behind, follow his address in the secondary hall from here. We have been live on Radio Rahma, the radio station. They have been streaming live also through Facebook, or Facebook and also we were streaming live on Jamia website. So we have been live on Radio Rahma, also visual through Facebook and also we have been live or we are live on the Jamia website. Shukran. So please be patient while the Sheikh moves. Thank you.
Let's be patient. Let us be patient. Let's have no movement as yet. As I said, we are going to follow the Sheikh's address from here. The others were following. So let us be patient also. The Sheikh's already there, and I think Brother Najib will take over now. Shukran. I am just like you. I am your brother in Islam. You will not get paradise because you saw me. It will not add value to your life in your grave. It will not add value to anything unless it has motivated you to do better, unless it has motivated you to do good, unless you have changed your life. Allah is never going to ask you, Did you see this Sheikh or that Sheikh or did you witness them or did you have a selfie with them and so on? That's not the question that's going to come. But the question that's going to come is, did you change your life for the sake of Allah? Did you develop? Did you start fulfilling your salah? Did you change your bad habits? Messenger came to you with a powerful message. Had it not been Allah and His Rasul that the message came from, you wouldn't even have known this particular messenger. I'm talking about myself. If I didn't speak from the Quran and the Sunnah, 
we would not know each other. What is the link between us? It is qala Allahu wa qala Rasulu. That is the link. There is no other link between us. In fact, if I had not been speaking about Allah and His Rasul, you would not have known me. That's what I'm saying. So my brothers and sisters, in order for us to achieve Jannah, to achieve success, let us let this meeting be a meeting whereby we can say our lives have changed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can never know the people I meet personally. Never. It's impossible because I'm a human being. They say you can know very closely 500 people as a human being. Beyond that, it cannot be close. It's an acquaintance. Yeah, I know them. I know them. But Allah knows every one of you individually, personally. He loves you. He's with you at absolutely every juncture. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely the one who will respond to your call. And it's the link with Allah that will actually make us people who are happier on earth and who will succeed in the akhirah. So that is my message for you today. To say, brothers and sisters, develop your link with Allah. Become people who are Humble for the sake of Allah. I'm sure you heard the message I delivered in the other hall, right? So I'm not going to go into that topic. I've just seized the opportunity to say a few words to tell you I'm just a human being. When you see me do something wrong or say something wrong, don't be shy to correct me. I hope it will be polite, but don't be shy to correct me, inshallah. I hope it will be with the correct intention, but it's your duty to let me know. Because I'm just a human. I can also. I can also say things sometimes and perhaps subhanallah out of human error, we might make mistakes. I, you might, for example, see me uh, say something, do something out of human nature that may not be ideal. <coughs> Every one of us to be ideal. Every one of us should be striving towards perfection. Although we will never get to perfection itself, but we will get somewhere. Somewhere meaning if I aim, if I aim at the sky, at least I'll get to the clouds. Do you get the point? If I aim at the sky, at least I'll get to the clouds. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. I'm really so, so touched. Uh, to see a large number of sisters and brothers uh, who have come uh, from far and wide. And I acknowledge that many of you have come from early in the morning and some came a little bit later. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. We thank uh, Sheikh Mufti Meng for his uh, coming to this choose him because he has a media uh, arrangement now so we bear with us please be seated until the sheikh moves and then we can all depart thank you very much assalamu alaikum